In physics, we can also consider frame of reference or relative velocity. I just want to explain a little bit about that, just a little bit of basics here. So this is actually really simple. Um, a frame of reference, you might say this, a frame of reference, that's all about you know, who is measuring what. That's just the key thing here. So this is actually pretty okay for most people. So who is measuring what? That's the important thing. Okay, so who is measuring what? That's the frame of reference. So because different people will measure different things. Um, so we can take a look at a few examples of that. Uh, maybe we'll do one example afterwards. Um, well, what I do for these, I just, I just imagine myself in a situation. So this is what I really do. I just imagine myself in a situation and I consider what would I see? Okay, so this is sort of, so what would I see? Or what would I detect? Now it turns out, I mean, this is relative velocity. It's all relative. I mean, it's all relative to who is measuring what. And it turns out you might have heard of relativity. That's something that Einstein, uh, well, figured out most of the things for that, especially, uh, well, we have special relativity and general relativity. And you might think that's really complicated stuff, and actually some of it is. But the main idea behind sort of relative things is just that. It depends on your frame of reference. So if you're sitting in, I don't know, a train, let's just say. So this is, this is me inside a train car right here. So if I'm just sitting in there, and so here's me, and I do my little experiment. Maybe I just throw a ball straight up. So, you know, so I just take a ball, I throw it straight up, so the ball goes up, and then it lands back in my hand. In the train, according to me, the ball will just go straight up and then land straight down. So this is, you know, according to me, this is what I would see. I would just see the ball go straight up and down. What if, though, my train had, you know, windows and someone could actually see the train go by? Um, and that means that this train, let's say it's going with some sort of velocity. So someone, let's say this would be um, someone on the ground, let's say. So just to show you that this here will be a totally different situation. So let's say the, uh, the thing that I'm doing, the experiment I'm doing is I take my ball, throw it straight up in the air, and then it lands in my hand. Well, according to me, I'll just see the ball go up and down, no problem. By the way, we're going to assume I'm going at a constant speed. It turns out that needs to be the case. But if I'm going at a constant speed, no problem. I'm just traveling in my train happily along, um, and I'll just throw it up and down. Now, even though I'm moving a certain velocity, me and my little ball that I'm using here, we're not going a different speed relative to each other. So I just see the ball go straight up and down, and it's as if the outside world whizzes by me at whatever velocity I was moving. But now if someone on the ground sees my experiment, let's say, well, we can consider point one. That's like when I actually, um, you know, launch the ball, let's say. So this will be me, you know, and I start, and I throw the ball up in the air. So here's the ball. Well then, of course, later on, a little bit later, whoops, uh, somehow my train got squished. I don't know why that happened. It shouldn't have. Um, so let's just assume then my train car, then this is a little bit later. So now let's say the ball is maybe right up in the air like this, and so maybe it's at its maximum height. And at some later time, I'm just taking snapshots. This is someone on the ground just watching me go. So they see me throw it here, but then, you know, maybe one second later, I'm actually over here. And now the ball is straight up. And then over here, this is me, and this time I've caught the ball. So this time the ball is right here. So if you look at this then, according to me, the ball just went up and then down. So that's all I saw. That was my frame of reference. Whereas, Someone on the ground watching this thing happen, they will have seen the ball do this path. Now watch carefully. Imagine this here is see-through. They will have seen the ball start here, go here, and then finish here. So they'll see the ball do a path like this. They will think the ball went, whoops. Well, I guess I didn't draw it very well. nice. I should probably have it go like this. So this is like the ball going like this, and then like this. So according to them, the ball went up, and then to the right, and then back down. So it did like a parabolic arch. So the person on the ground saw the ball do something like this, whereas me, I just saw the ball go up and then straight down. 
Do you see how what I see and what the person on the ground sees are totally different? That's because we have different frames of reference. See, it all depends on who's measuring what. Now, it doesn't have to be so complicated looking. Actually, it turns out, by the way, if you consider this example here, but instead of throwing a ball, I shine light straight up, have it bounce off a mirror and come down. And I do the same thing, and I'm just really careful with my units. Turns out you can derive uh, special relativity equations just from this. Turns out if you're doing special relativity, it comes just from this exact thing. It's nothing brain busting here. It just says that, well, according to you, it goes straight up and down. According to someone watching you, it'll, it's like the light will go up, bounce off something and go down. It's all about finding these lengths and basically how far the light went and how long it took it. And you'll see that these don't always match up. That's why we call it relativity because it's relative. It all depends on who measures what. So let's do an example. So I have an example here where I drive my car north at 30 meters per second relative to the ground. Maybe before anything else, I'll just draw that. So here is a vector for someone who's sitting on the ground. They're going to see me going 30 meters per second. So I'll say that's, that's well, not me. I guess that'll be you. So I'll maybe just delete that. Whoops. There we go. So I'll actually label it as instead of me, I'll say that's you. Now, while you're driving, though, someone approaches you from behind. And uh, that car is going 50 meters per second relative to the ground. So if you're someone on the ground, or let's say you're in the air watching this, let's say you're floating in a nice hot air balloon or something like that, watching this happen, then you're going to see this. Well, assuming you're still over the ground, at least. Uh, by the way, in airplanes, we often talk about a ground speed. and It's just exactly this. It's all how fast you're going relative to the ground. So we have 50 meters per second is that other car. So that's the that's the other car. And it's going this fast compared to you. But the question is, after it passes you, what is the car's speed relative to you? That's because if I asked what's the car's speed relative to the ground, it's boring. The car's speed relative to the ground is always 50 meters per second. But we don't care about what someone in, let's say, the hot air balloon right above this situation is. We care about what you're going to see. And it's nice and easy. It turns out you take this vector, subtract that vector. So it turns out you'll just be, well, 30, uh, 50 minus 30, which will be 20 meters per second. So you're going to see him. He's going to pass you and sort of be going as if you're stopped. And he's going 20 meters per second, sort of forward or north. So that's how we can deal with this. Now, this stuff about relative velocities, it's actually really interesting. I mean, you can have all sorts of other weird situations. I've actually had it when I was first learning how to fly. Um, I was flying in my plane. Now let's assume that my plane flies at 100 kilometers an hour. Let's just say I'm going this fast, 100 kilometers per hour. Let's just say I'm going that fast. Well, it turns out there was actually one day when, um, I mean, this is, this is my speed relative to the wind. And it turns out in an airplane, we consider what's called a wind speed and a ground speed. And they're not always the same. So when I say this speed, I have to say this is maybe my, uh, let's say that was my ground speed. So that really means that I'm going to travel, you know, over the ground, I'm going to go 100 kilometers every single hour. So if I travel for one hour, I've gone 100 kilometers in distance over the ground, like on a map. And the point in an airplane is to fly around and get somewhere. Well, let's face it, it's also pretty fun. So you can just fly around and go wee as you go up and down and do all sorts of things. But your ground speed, let's say, is 100 kilometers an hour. Okay, fine. But what if all of a sudden a whole bunch of wind? Because we haven't included wind here. So if you're flying in your airplane and all of a sudden there's a headwind, and maybe that headwind is 50 kilometers per hour. Well, now, if... Instead of a ground speed, that's what I had without wind. This actually now becomes what's called my uh, air speed. And it turns out that's why we call it uh, air speed indicator. Because when you're actually in your airplane, you have a little device that can measure the air speed. It just measures how fast air is moving um, you know, across your wings or across your little pitot tube, as it's called. It's a little detector that just detects how fast air is moving relative to you or how fast you're moving relative to the air. Here's the problem though, if you have a 100 kilometers per hour airspeed and there's a 50 kilometer per hour headwind, then your ground speed is only 50 kilometers per hour, which means you're going forward still, 
you're still flying happily, but you're only going 50 kilometers per hour forward. And I've actually seen this happen with myself. I had actually a headwind that was very close to my own airspeed. And no kidding, I remember seeing this. This totally blew me away because I'm flying happily. My airplane thinks I'm flying really nice and fast, but there was a gigantic, ridiculous wind. I can't remember exactly how strong it was now, but it was a considerable portion of what I was going, you know, what I was flying through the air. And I remember that although I was flying happily and I'm, you know, flying through the air, I looked down at the ground and it looks like I was barely moving. That's maybe because instead of this being 50, let's just say this was, instead of that, maybe it was like 80, let's just say. Let's say I was flying at what I think is 100 km an hour airspeed, uh, but the wind in front of me is actually going 80. That means I'm really only flying 20 kilometers per hour above the ground. Like that's my ground speed, which means it'll take me a lot longer to get somewhere. That's why sometimes when you fly, let's say, from uh, North America to Europe, sometimes your, uh, sp your time it takes you to travel is much shorter in one direction as the other. That's because there is a lot of wind up in, uh, up in the air. And so when you're flying, you actually have this thing, uh, you have these big series of wind that actually flies uh, from, uh, well, between North America and Europe, you actually cross through this thing called a jet stream. And it depends on which way you fly, and that can make your time to actually fly this much longer or much shorter, depending on which direction you're going. And again, it's all about relative speed.